Crouch. Bind. Set. Joe presents the House of Rugby, Season 3. Hello and welcome to House of Rugby, brought to you by Joe. Our guests for this week, Jonathan Davis, and back for more is Sean O'Brien. Um, Jonathan, I'm going to start with you because obviously you listened to last week's podcast with great interest. Um, but Adam and Sean, were, well, they weren't unkind, but Adam basically said that you were going to toe the party line, not gov- give us anything great. Sean was a little bit more complimentary, <laughs> mostly about your tan and your hair. So yeah. have the right of the reply. Yeah, the, the two boys had the head start on me and, um, you know, bomb being bomb. I think he's set me up for a fail and you know, I, I'll <laughs> take Sean's words and I'll try and do as best I can, you know. So um, I'm glad he likes the hair. He, he's, he's still using the wet look gel, I think I had when I was 11 years old, Sean. It's, there, actually, so, it's uh, actually called Brill Cream. Brill Cream, yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's Brill Cream. Brill the one cream. in the red tub. Do you remember the one in the red tub, actually? Oh, a big scoop and then slap it on. Is it? Yeah, yeah. You'd have, to, you'd have to wash the hands I, I, after too. I, th- I think my grandfather was using that. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but how, how are you, Sean? You right? I'm good, yeah, and You? How's uh, yeah, how's can... things coming along? Not too bad. Um, obviously, picked up a bump against your fellow countrymen uh, a few weeks back, but um, you now back in training this week now, so it's not as bad as I thought. So, uh, what about you? What, with like two old injured. Yeah, this is like an players. episode of Casualty. <laughs> Injured again. Yeah, we just need flashing blue lights. What what, what happened? <laughs> um, I actually actually played the full eighty, felt perfect, and then on Tuesday I went to train and um, calf was very tight, so I had a scan and gave my uh, soleus a fair, fairly significant tear, and it was it's a weird one actually because I had no symptoms until I actually went yeah. out and started running, and yeah, I was bitterly disappointed during the week because felt great um, in the lead up to the the Worcester game as well I was um, I only had one week's prep because I was in um, yeah. isolation for two weeks because I was in close contact so that that oh. definitely um, had a had a factor to play in it so you can only train in the house um, so were, on a walk bike were you doing that burpee challenge again as that's all I remember from what, uh, lockdown is you doing burpees nah, I, so. I, I, I left that off this time my back was broke after that honestly <laughs> <laughs> one. I don't know why I started it genuinely, but um, I'm glad I finished it actually. Yeah, there's um, there's so many things going on during lockdown, but I was I was actually glad of it. Um, I got a hundred and what did I get? hundred and seventy eight or something in twenty minutes. <laughs> um, John, when are you coming back? When will you be fit? You said you're going to play this week. Uh, training this week and then uh, depending on selection so we'll see how we go I, I, you know, hopefully like to get depending back depending on team. selection <laughs> <laughs> sure who else well, is going to play you're... there at the minute oh I don't know I'm only asking sort of out of selfishness as well because I thought that you were joining me on channel 4 for um, the first Champions Cup match but that doesn't sound likely no well hopefully I can um, I think we got bath the same day so um, you do, prior, yeah. Uh, yeah occupied um Hopefully playing down in the wreck and hopefully in front of crowds, uh, which is exciting. That would be um, nice. Lee, there's yeah. one thing you have to know about Foxy. He's cash, cash is king. Cash is king. <laughs> give, him, give him enough cash and he'll, he'll leave the game off. He'll, he'll be there right <laughs> good, That's actually a good Scottish attitude. I like that. That's why he's into all his horses now at the minute as well. He's, he has a, he's a very good horse at the minute. That's, that's I think not money. We've making. all had ra- we've all got race horses, but I don't think they make money. Finn Russell's got who's coming on the program later. He's got a, a leg in a race horse as well. You've got you've had horses, Sean, have you not? Yeah, I've had a few as well. Yeah, there, it's um, yeah, you get the odd good one, but you get a lot of donkeys too. So, <laughs> Foxes uh, is a very good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you going to give us a few shares? Them. Any shares going, Foxy? No shares, no shares. He's all tied up, unfortunately. But um, nice, you know, nice. I think he might run in a few weeks, and we hopefully might take him to Cheltenham, um, give oh. a go in, in the festival. So not a bit, not an exclusive, but um, you know, fingers crossed. He, he can, did the cross uh, country, the, didn't he, a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, and he did well. He enjoyed it, um, and I, I think um, you know that's something uh, Christian, the horse trainer, wants to look at. So yeah. Um, We'll probably talk about more about that close to the time. Will you go back for the... I know we're meant to talk rugby, but I actually don't care at this stage. Will you go back for the Welsh National <laughs> again? Um, not sure. I think um, he was like 
he was almost, you know, crippled after that race because it's such a testing race. And um, we'd love to give him a proper shot at the Grand National. So um, maybe we might leave that this year and then um, let him rest up and get fresh, ready to go uh, for the Grand National. So, you know, it, it's it, none of my decision, but I'll just listen to Christian. He's he, he's the wizard <laughs> of it all. If you need a good jockey, Foxy, give me a shout. Yeah. Who do you know, Ed? <laughs> I wouldn't put you on the back of him. <laughs> I remember I got sent a photo of my brother on top of Potter and I was literally mortified. I thought he'd break his back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get him down off it. Too heavy, yeah. too heavy. All right, I suppose we should talk about some rugby, actually. Uh, Nigel Owens was heralded at the weekend because he refed his 100th test match. Uh, but it was another referee in Roman Poit who actually took the headlines. Um, it was in the Wales match. Dan Bigger looked like he was clearly taken out in the air, the TMO calls it in, um, but he was overruled. And then I think Alan Wynne Jones went up and said, Take a look at that. And Roman Poit said, No, we're not going to take a look at it. I know that Wayne Pivak has contacted World Rugby about it, he said in his interview afterwards. Um, what did you make of it, John? Uh, look, you know, Biggs looks like he's taken in the air. Um, like, you know, that's pretty obvious. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Roman doesn't go back and have a look at it, you know, and I think. Um, you know, the, the try does come from that turnover, um, you know, and we're not saying that it would have changed the results, but, you know, I think it was, um, Biggs got tackled in the air and, it, you know, it should have been a penalty at least, you know, so um, it was hugely disappointing, but I think, you know, what you got to remember is that, you know, heat of the moment, um, you know, refs are taking on a lot and you don't know whether you, you just want to get on with the game, you don't know, but I am... Um, from a Welsh perspective, it was hugely disappointing that, you know, something that we was, you know, you could see what happened. It wasn't, um, wasn't, um, we were given the penalty. It's, it's absolutely madness though. It's something that's a bugbearer for me, these, these type of decisions, because you have, you know, you have a clear try scored in, in certain games and they're going upstairs to check it. You have someone yeah. taken out in the air. There's a video, there's a, a the video ref is saying, He's taken out in the air. He's taken out in the air, oh man. And he's basically closed his ears to it. Like, yeah. that's a penalty. Like, no. so for players, no wonder like Welsh players and Irish players, and I've had it in the past before, we get so frustrated because the consistency is all over the place. Like someone like Nigel and like massive kudos to him for, for reaching his 100 at the weekend. But he's very consistent in the way he referees every game. He's, he, sometimes he has off days and... As, as we all do, you know, we're human at the end of the day, but yeah. the rules are the rules. And big decisions in games like that do have consequences, um, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, to everyone involved. So, like, I don't know why he doesn't listen to his, uh, the, the, the fourth official there and, like, mm. call it a penalty. That's what it was at the time. He's taken in yeah. the air. It's a penalty. End of story. But he... Um, he just ignored it. And I actually like Roman Pot. Everyone, I remember years ago uh, doing analysis of uh, games when you were with Leinster and everyone would be like, do not speak to Roman Pot. The coaches would say, don't speak to Roman Pot. I'd go to the coaches afterwards and goes, I'll speak to him. I like him. I get on well with him. I have a good relationship with him on the field. And I always, I always do. And I always like Roman Pot, but he definitely got that one wrong at the weekend, I felt. Yeah. It was a, it was like a bad, bad said, call. I, I, I enjoy his company as well. Like, I... I have this thing like obviously when he was a ref when i was out in france he'd ref more of the league games and now whenever he's refing us i'd like throw a little bit of my broken french in and he'd always like think like shut up because it's terrible french and stuff and you you'd have a decent relationship with him and you know it's like you said human errors come in but you know he should have yeah. you know trusted his fourth official that's what they're there for even if he went back and watched it and he said no it's, it was he wasn't taken out you know at least he gives it a chance to reassess it and not have um you know, the heat of the moment take over, really. I don't really know how it works in terms of that TMO. Can he not uh, sort of push a little bit harder? And, and you know, is he only allowed one call to the ref to suggest it? I don't know, because he, he, he went back for the Welsh try. He said, that mm. is it a knock knock on instead of a charge down? And Roman said, no, no, that for me is a, that is a charge down. Um, so, you know, they went back and looked at that and then he overruled it. And whether or not that then the, the the lack of trust maybe you don't know um mm -hmm. whether you thought no i made the decision i'm just gonna back myself but um you know and um unfortunately from a welsh perspective it was um you know we felt it was the wrong call 
I, I'd wonder I'd wonder if the stadium was full. Would he have, yeah. would would the pressure of the crowd would you know what I mean? The atmosphere there. The referees feel that definitely on days. I wonder would he have went, hold on, let me check this. Like yeah. when you make an error in that stadium, you'd know about it pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> oh you do, so, even if you're the last person does. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which is strange, like um so like I, I wonder like if the crowd was there. I, I've said it before about like captains and stuff. They don't have a big an, as big an influence because they can't get away with chatting to the referee as much without the crowd there and saying little bits and pieces to him as we go through the game. That probably had a factor to play in as well because Alan Wynn doesn't want to keep pushing him and, and annoying him. I remember years ago against England, or sorry, against the E-Foxy in, in Dublin. And yeah. um, I was reviewing the game. Wayne Barnes was the referee. And all you can hear me, Adam, the whole game is just squealing at him. Release, <laughs> hands away. Um, yeah. You know, and they're off the their crowd, feet. They, with the crowd, <laughs> they might not hear that, that, that chat there. Like, yeah. like, I do the same. Like, he's holding, he's holding. And, yeah. you know, and, and you know, Nigel always hates it because I think whenever he refs a derby, that's all he is, is like, us boys, like, getting into him, making a decision. You know, it's it's... It's difficult with a crowd. It's it's like background noise, but when there's no crowd, you obviously they hear what all the boys are saying. You know, I always say to referees, I'm trying to help them referee the game <laughs> as best I can. I'm only giving them a hand. I'm not trying to be annoying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it is a thankless job, though, in many ways, isn't it? Because unless it's like Nigel Owens' um, 100th, you know, they're very rarely getting great press. It's either maybe Wayne Barnes speaking two languages and in a match gets a bit of coverage or Nigel 100th gets a coverage. Otherwise, we tend to talk about referees when there has been an error. I just wonder what both of you look for in a referee. What what makes good refereeing? Is it like consistency or communication? Yeah, I think that's that's the main one really is consistency. Uh, like when you walk, go on the field, you know what you're going to get. You want them to be approachable. Um, I think you know c- certain players, you know, just just query certain decisions. They're not like having a go or anything. They just would like to know. And and if you're not a captain and you can't approach a ref, it it, it almost it builds you up your frustration because you do, you're not like you're shouting them. You just want a clarification on something because you don't want to do the the same thing twice and get uh, banged twice for it, you know? So, um, you know, it, it's consistency and being approachable for me. I think that's, that's two keys for referees. I'd agree completely too. Uh, as players, that's the frustrating part when there's, you have a, you have a really good game one week and the ref has done his job and he's abided to the laws that are there for him to, to enforce in the game. And then the following week you go out and another referee has a different interpretation of those laws. And that's not consistent. Um, so for yeah, for me as well, it's definitely the consistency and someone who is approachable. You don't want the referee that's telling you to go away when you are trying to actually. There might be something that you haven't seen, which you're asking the referee, "What was that for, sir?" And he's giving, he's just waving you away. You, uh, like yeah. as Foxy said, you don't want to be going back to your team with with your hands in the air, going, "He won't tell me," like, um, or he won't, he won't talk to me even. Um, so I don't know, like it's it's definitely um, something that. I think for us players, we like talking to referees and we like yeah. a, an open line of communication rather than being blanked anyway. At least we can learn that and move forward and and um, crack on with the game. Yeah, and it get better as well because obviously, you know, we're, we're like, you, you speak to touch judges when like teams are going for penalties and you, you'll ask a touch judge, you know, what was that call for? And you think you think is right and, you know, they'll just be like, well, no, I'm, I'm over here, out the way, you know, I'm just holding the flag, you know. So um, it's just, I think um, it's, you just want to have a good time because obviously, you know, when, you, when you're playing, you're enjoying it. We're very lucky to, you know, play international rugby and, you know, it's not that we want to create enemies. We, you know, we want to um, make the experience as good for everyone and possibly, you know. Sean, you mentioned the relationship with um, Roman Poit, but do teams analyse um, or, you know, look at the ref before they're taken on a game, not just the opposition? Does it actually matter? Oh, it, it absolutely matters because for someone like Roman Poit, for instance, he's, um, he's very hot in the breakdown and he might have trends of giving away, um, giving a penalty to, to a certain team within the first minute for not rolling away, for instance. That could be his thing mm-hmm. at the start of a game that he has in his head. I want to make sure the rook is clean. Whereas someone like Nigel will let teams battle it out there and whoever wins kind of collisions, you know that that's going to be the way it is for the day. Um, so there is different interpretations. And at the international level, 
Um, not that I'm there now, but Foxy, they're, they're definitely still analysing referees and making sure that the things that the refs are really hot on consistently over their previous games are the players are aware of them and know going into the game, lads, these are the few things we need to watch here. Leave him alone. If he's a referee that's not approachable, leave him alone. Don't be chatting to him. Don't be annoying him. Um, don't be harassing him. So it's um, it's it's a big part of the game as well because he, at the end of the day, is the man in the middle and he's trying to control 30 rugby players. Um, and it is a difficult job. Like I wouldn't do it for diamonds <laughs> because uh, I'm kind of I probably I'm probably looking at younger lads coming up now and saying I hope they're not like me when I was coming up along and squealing <laughs> at the referees and and basically pestering them for the whole eighty minutes. I mean, actually, on the flip side of that as well, Lee, I think it takes away from your game sometimes. I found like mm-hmm. that Welsh game in in Dublin, the one that I got really frustrated with. When I look back on my own personal performance. I was I was distracted. I was um, you know I was too busy with too busy with um, Wayne Barnes trying to he- trying to help him referee the game as I'm calling it. Um, but I was it took away from my own game a little bit. So it's 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 an area I suppose where you have to let the referee do their job, but they have to be approachable as well and they have to know the rules of the game and be consistent is what we want. Yeah, and I think it's like you said, there's so much work going on from uh, analysing refs' tendencies, whether they favour uh, defence penalties or attack penalties. And you know, going into a game, you're aware of where they might set a precedent, like contact area or offside line, stuff like that. So, you know, you got to you got a heads up uh, before you go on the field what, what they prefer to, what they tend to look at as a, a tendency. Or if you're Wales, you just cheat as much as you can. <laughs> Hi, in, every, on now. In, in every... <laughs> Fast as the game. <laughs> we just copy what you guys do in the breakdown. That's all we're doing. <laughs> yeah, as I said, being a referee is a thankless task. I think we can all agree on that one. Um, okay, I'm interested in your thoughts on whether sport and particularly rugby has a responsibility to be entertaining. There's so much, particularly during this Autumn Nations Cup, in the press um, on you know topics on, on different websites and things. Um, John, what do you think? It's difficult because. A test rugby, I think you there's such fine margins, and you know the little mistake giving teams an easy into the twenty two to opportunity to score. So there's there's less scope for you to you know obviously try out. I think you know as a team we're almost in a bit of uh, a transition, trying to play a new style of play, be a bit more expansive and attacking. But um, we're still developing that at the moment. But I think when you come up against teams like England who are very kick heavy, you've almost got to match them because you're, you know, you're setting yourself up for fail if you're just going to run from anywhere because mistakes will happen. You give away the ball, turnovers, and they get good field position. I think teams just don't want to give up um, field position in this game because it's, you know, I think there is a want to play, but there's there's a cautiousness to everything as well, and mm-hmm. I think that cautiousness is taking over the the chance to express yourself, which is it's difficult. But I think it's 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 just how Test rugby is. It's, it's always it's been like that for a while now. I think. Yeah, it's, it 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 doesn't matter at Test level whether you win the game by fifty or by a point. At the end of the day, um, to teams and like there's not too many teams out there that can go and really express themselves that well every day, uh, every time they go out to a test match. The All Blacks can do it at times. And like I was, I was, I was kind of thinking about that as Foxy's talking there. They, the risk to reward is massive in the game nowadays. And like defence is the biggest, one of the biggest things rather than attack at the minute. So if you have a good defence, you nine times out of ten, you probably win the game. Because you get the ball back, because you get field position, uh, because you get into good areas of the field, so it's 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 a, it's a funny one to see how it'll play out over the next while. But I I have thought about the All Blacks a little bit about the way they're able to change their attacking game to suit different oppositions. And I remember the first Lions test, Foxy, the way they played off nine, really really tight to the rook. Yeah. The first test, and we were yeah. prepping all week. We were prepping all week for them to play off ten, yeah. and we were going to get we were going to force them back and back and back and deeper and deeper. The next minute the game starts and these boys have come up with something we've never seen before <laughs> and they're able straight to use guts, yeah. straight up the guts and they're able <laughs> yeah. to use little tip-ons right at the line inside and outside of the, the main carrying threat and it was like a shock to the system because 
you don't know how to adapt to that. And they're probably the ones that do evolve a little bit quicker than everyone else. Then everyone else tries to catch up with them and say, oh, well, that's a good idea. Um, let's try that. But it takes it takes a while. As Foxy's saying, they're, they're in a transition. Ireland are in a transition period at the minute, trying to play a little bit more. And England, as you said, are very kick-heavy. England kicked more than any other in, in the Six Nations. But it works for them because they do force people into making errors and they do force teams to drop a ball. And with their D that they have as well and the, and the players they have within their D system, um, you know, they don't lose too many collisions. And they're able to slow teams up and, you know, get into an arm wrestle with them. I think if you have a good defence, you know, it's, it's foundations for a great team. Like if you could almost guarantee that you, your defence is going to hold the opposition to say 15, 16 points, then your you attack doesn't have to fire. There's no pressure on you to go, right, if you're going to give away 25 points, you've got to go out and score 26 points. I think it's, you know, there's so much emphasis on D and uh, containing the opposition. And then, on the flip side, then you're making sure that you, um, you know, make sure you play in the right areas. And you know, if you know, if if it doesn't come off, then you, you're just gonna it's coming to bite you in the bite you in the ass. And really, so it's 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 a difficult one to get a balance. And I think you know, we all want to go out and play, but I think, like Shawnee said, the most important thing is winning. And at the moment. Yeah. Um, being without the ball is sometimes more um, effective. It's interesting though, I, you know, when uh, Jamie George got his hat trick, everyone's like, oh, well, you know, he made about 10 metres or something. And then Johnny uh, May goes and scores that one try against Ireland and everyone is sort of waxing lyrical about it. I think there's an awful lot of um, how a try is scored as well that deems whether it's entertaining or not. Do you think, Sean? Yeah, I do think. But, you know, you look at that, you look at that try Johnny May got, it was absolutely terrible defence. By Ireland, so like they should never score from drawing twenty-two. So you look, you look at that side of it straight away as a spectator and as someone who's been in that situation. You look at well, where did we go wrong there? Okay, we got flat-footed and got done on the outside. And when Johnny May gets into a bit of space, he's gone. Like, um, yeah. see, you look at it from that aspect. From an English point of view, yeah, brilliant. They scored from draw twenty-two. From an Irish point of view, terrible defence to let him score from the twenty-two. Um, so there is like there, are, there obviously is touches a class by different teams and little plays to do and long lo- uh, long phases of play that leads to tries that are absolutely incredible to watch. But something like that, I wouldn't class that as a good try. I'd class that as terrible defending. <laughs> yeah, you could, you could tell the tries that are constructed on the training ground. Like I remember when, whenever we play Ireland, like, there's an emphasis on, you know, first three phases in defence because Ireland were like Leinster, we're always good at set play moves and, you know, um, we'd always be on red alert in those first three phases because they'd always try something. And once we got into a multi-phase against Ireland, we'd not be more comfortable, but we knew that their main threat was the first three phases. And, you know, I think it's it's just how you prep for a team and you know, how teams' traits are. And, like, yeah, those, those tries that are three phases planned on a training for park are far, far more clinically done then but you both watched the internationals at the weekend so in honesty like did you find it did you find them boring foxy frustrating um i think from um a playing point i think there's you appreciate the attritional nature of the game i think the the wales england game was like a physical test match um but like yeah there was probably um a lack of ambition but i think you know wales england games are never high scoring affairs you know like that. they're just they're just tight battles and that was a you know a proper test match and um you know you look at Ireland Georgia Georgia put up a little bit of a fight to start with they scored a great try but then Laz Shawnee probably alluded to about the Johnny May try he'd probably say the Georgia try was bad defense you know so it's there is um stuff because has to go hand in hand um with those games looking at those games at the weekend and um there is an element of frustration, obviously, and you can see it from a spectator's point of view, like that it's, oh, Jesus, there's nothing really happening here. It's it's nearly like you're looking at, at pain trying at times, but it is it is what it is at that level. And like, I, I know Ireland will be fuming over the weekend about like their performance, especially in the second half. But like the Georgians, in fairness to them, have improved a lot. And are absolutely humongous. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they're, 
<laughs> like it's like having it's like having fifteen uh, back rows or fifteen second rows on the field um, when you see some of those boys. So they are hard and they are. Uh, it's not easy manage them, but Ireland, like with their quality they have, should have probably put a lot more points on them. But um, yeah, they did. They did create that try. But again, again, you look back on that and you pull it apart and you go, you know, we just just off the beat and D again. Um, but he done well to finish it. It was a great finish. It was a great finish. And yeah, those those men are bred to fight those Georgians. We had a couple in Claremont, and um, we we'd end up uh, doing wrestling and um, Sirakash Billy, the tight dead. I don't know if you remember him. Shortly. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we, we'd end up doing wrestling and it was my go to go against him and I was on top of him and then in, before I could blink he was on top of me you know, absolute monster of a bloke fair play to him them boys be wrestling animals sure, and everything oh, yeah <laughs> absolutely don't mess with yeah. them <laughs> no. do you think they've done enough to, to be in a I don't know whether it's going to be a, a six nations seven nations this constant conversation of whether it should be them or Italy from what you've seen over the last few weeks are they better than Italy I mean, they hadn't scored a point until until Sunday against Ireland. I don't know if they're better than Italy, obviously, but you know, I think the more time to get together, I'd love to know how long they're in camp for, for instance, and be able to perform like they performed in in the in the two games they played. But like, do they deserve a chance? Absolutely. But you know, the development of the game as a whole over there like needs to be looked at first and foremost, and make sure they have that longevity if they are coming into that competition to keep producing, you know, good athletes, good players. Um, that are going to compete and not just go in there and get and get spanked every week. Um, you know, that's not good for the game and it's not good for them either. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's making sure that they can uh, start, at, you know, the ground up. And I think, you know, not losing all their players to foreign clubs and stuff like that would be a start. And, um, you know, I think they are developing and they are getting better, which is good to see. And, um, you know, it's, it's just time. I think they need is to, to to maintain their development. So you mentioned um, working from the ground up. It's interesting to know what will happen to try and keep participation levels up because I'm sure a lot of kids might be watching rugby at the weekends and they might not want to uh, be the next John Davis or Sean O'Brien. Because how do you encourage a kid to get their hand on the ball when you're seeing a very different style of rugby, particularly to what their parents have played as well? Uh, how how do you sort of encourage that, John? Um, it's a good question. I think um, you know we need to make sure that um, you know when when there's opportunities um, to come to play, and you know there's you have to be more accurate on the field and stuff. There is a responsibility as players to make sure that, you know, uh, people want to be involved in the game. And I think, you know, hopefully soon enough crowds come back and atmospheres come. And then that, that, that makes a game um, far, far better as well. You know, I think it, it is difficult at the moment with no crowds um, generating that intensity and atmosphere that we had, you, you know, we're used to. And I think I remember going to Cardiff to watch a Wales game when I was a kid and it was, you know, the big stadium, the noise, uh, singing the anthem. I think, you know, not saying it's just a player's um, putting on the field, but like that whole experience uh, to come back would be am- would be amazing. So I think as players, you know, we do try, uh, you know, our, our very best in the week, trying to put a product on the, on the field that's entertaining. Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't come off, but I think... It's, it's the perseverance like we are we, we, where we are at at the moment just to you know keep building and improving um, especially from a Welsh point of view we're trying to get better and you know it's it's almost like a work in progress really but Sean that surely is a world rugby job to make it more entertaining do you think yeah it probably is they'll probably have a look at the game again um, soon and you know knowing world rugby they'll probably change a few bits and pieces but um, if it helps the game get a little bit more exciting, great. Um, like as players, as Foxy's alluded to there, you're never going out with the weekend with a plan to just play boring rugby or to not entertain or to not score tries. You all, you, as, as players, we want to do that. We always say it during the, we say it during the weeks in our clubs and our in our for our countries. We want to we want to go out and score tries. But as we've alluded to earlier in the program, it's it's one point will do us. To, to win by so when you're out there and you have 15 lads coming charging at you and you're meeting them head on you know what I mean it's it's easy for you to sit on the couch at home and go ah oh, this is terrible <laughs> these boys aren't they're not entertaining us 
but we're, we're out there trying like, um, yeah. and that's what pe- people have to be reminded of too. And the other thing is, I think for kids coming up along at their level, it's, it's very different when you get to a professional level and into an academy or, you know, when things start to get really serious, but I don't think it's going to take away from the enjoyment factor of kids coming through the underage systems in Ireland, England, Wales, um, all over the world. I think they're still going to enjoy what they're doing. They're out there with their best friends, running around with the ball, firing it around. They don't know anything about patterns or bonus points <laughs> or, you know what I mean? But that's like that's yeah. that's the way it is at, at a young age. You they just want enjoyment. And I think, you know, for us as professionals, obviously, we'll see what World Rugby bring. But for the younger generation, they still love it. I, I go home to Tullow and I go out there on a Sunday morning and there's 250 kids playing. I don't see any of them asking, hey, what type of brand of rugby are you playing this week? Like? <laughs> I, I think what's, what's great is like, you know, as, as a kid, the fundamentals of what makes rugby great, you know, uh, being in a team environment, playing with your mates and, you know, just having fun. And, you know, probably, thankfully, they can't kick until they're 13. So um, that (laughs) makes it easier for them to play a bit more. (laughs) You're watching The House of Rugby on Joe. If both of you could make one change, um, what would that be? What would you change? I think we've just had Finn join in, has he? <laughs> Finn, how are you doing, boy? <laughs> I'm all right. That's, That's called passing the buck, Foxy. That is called passing yeah, the buck. We're, we're, correcting, we're correcting rugby. Have you got any points to add? What, what's wrong with rugby? What would you do, words? Finn? <laughs> I don't know. Um, what would I do? I, I don't know. Um, take the scrums out, but that then um, just stop a lot of guys playing, I suppose. <laughs> they take up a lot of time. Sean, you're out. <laughs> yeah, just 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 have backs on the field, no forwards. <laughs> yeah, that'd be better, I think. <laughs> Zebo's probably there in the background somewhere, Finn, is he? <laughs> nah, he's not here today. So <laughs> <laughs> he's never too far away from you. <laughs> I know, I know. I like the way you've just slotted in, Finn, just like completely just suddenly appeared in this conversation and it's like you've been there from the start. Um, (laughs) How is Paris treating you? I mean, you're adding to our casualty club. We've basically got three players now who aren't playing at the moment. Um, How's France treating you? It's good. Um, Obviously still in lockdown, like back home, so that's not changed. But um, no, it's good fun getting back in into the boys, into the club. Um, And I was back in training today with them all, so it was good. Improving. How long till you're back? Well, it's maybe going to be this weekend, but I don't think it will be. So hopefully next weekend um, for the Champions Cup. Uh, we've got Bordeaux away, so um, this weekend. So I'll take it easy for the home game next week. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Nicely done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it looks like from um, social media and from yourself and Zeebs and and uh, a few other boys there that it's a great club and great fun to be in. Yeah, no, nah, it's, it's good fun. Um, when we train with it's like it's full on obviously but then outside of that it's a good laugh everyone has a everyone gets on well there's a good um, environment at the club um, players and coaches like, we all get on pr- pretty well so it's good fun um, and when, like I say when you train you train hard but it's a lot of laughs on the way as well so I came over to film with you when I think you'd been there what eight months or something and yeah. um, you were getting to grips with your French so where where's it at now are you fluent Nah, nah, I'm not fluent. Um, it's obviously getting better, but I, I wouldn't say I'm fluent. Um, I'll take take a few more years for that, I think. But um, nah, like I said, it's getting better. I'll speak to most of, most of the boys in French now, um, or I'll try anyway. And I've said to them, they have to speak to me in French now because at the start it was all just in English. Even if I was trying to speak in French, they try and practice their English. So I would find it hard to understand if there's conversations going on because they all speak to me in English. So. Um, it's getting better now, um, and I'm getting the hang of it. So, do you all know each other from the Lions tour as well? You all um, were did the Lions tour. You came in a little bit late to that one, Finn. Did you actually see the boys? Ah, uh, briefly. Yeah, I, I was, didn't. I didn't. We I, didn't. I, I, we I didn't split, see Finn too much. Into two different squads by then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> split into two different squads by then. So, I think I was on a different schedule to you boys. <laughs> <laughs> what was, what you, was you the were the name? PM schedule. No, no, what was the yeah. name? What was the name that was put on the voice? The Assassins, well, was the it? Binge. No, the I don't know. I was going to say the Binges, but I don't know. I think it was the Assassins or something. Is that, are the Assassins, Assassins gone out again? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what you're talking yeah. about. 
I think we've been talking about uh, rugby getting a bit of stick at the moment for not being the most exciting, particularly in the Autumn Nations Cup. Um, I think that that's a can that you certainly don't carry, but there must be an awful lot of pressure on you because you're always talked about as being flamboyant and um, just, you know, such a good player to watch. Is that something that you can sort of see in yourself or when you watch back your matches? I don't know. I don't really see it myself. It's just how I like to play and how how we play here at Racing, which is good fun. Um, I think, yeah, watching these autumn tests, there's been a lot of kicking in the mall. Um, you know, I think even like the, the France, um, who was France, who was it, the weekend? Italy, wasn't it? France, Italy, was it? There's like 40 odd kicks each team or something. It was like 45 kicks a team, which is crazy. So, um, there's, I mean, some people are saying that the teams that kick most are the teams that win in which is, I suppose, the stats show that, but I think there's kind of just a lot of kick tennis going on now. So for people watching it, it's not really that much fun. You know, I think over here at Ration, we like, we, you have to kick at times, but we like to use the short attacking kicks and as well as clearing our lines when we have to. But, uh, you know, we've got some some great players um, in the backs and the forwards. So holding on to the ball is maybe better for us than it is to kick it away. Um, half of our game, game plan, just chuck the ball to Virame and see what he does. So... That makes it easy for me. It's not a bad game plan to have. Man. <laughs> <I know. laughs> we either give the ball to Cami to pick and go or to carry it or to Virame. <laughs> in terms of your play, Finn, do you feel it's um, developed more since you've been in France or is this something that you've always done even when you were starting out in rugby and it's, they've just maybe, you know, let you have more confidence to do it? I think it's probably how I've always played. Um, I think when I came through at Glasgow, Gregor was trying to change it into the, a, a fast a fast playing team so that suited the way I like to play and then with Vern at Scotland he did the same um, uh, and over here in France they like they like to play wide or they like to play um, free flow and rugby um, and with, with Mike coming in and doing attack this year he's he's big for us to play wide as well as if we have to obviously go up the jersey and play direct but we've got the licence to, to play this open expansive game when we want to and like I kind of said about you know the players we've got, it, it suits us as a team um, and as a group that, um, that us playing that style of rugby works well for us. How much does that change though when you go back to Scotland then? Because obviously you've got to play with the players that you have round about you. So, you know, how much does that alter? Yeah, it obviously changes. Um, I think the way, the way that I was used to attacking at Racing is slightly different to, to Scotland. Obviously test matches are, are different to club level games. Um, so you might have to slightly adjust anyway. And like I said earlier, I think when I went back, I tried to maybe bring a few things in that we do at Racing to the, to the Scotland setup. You know, I've not been there in, well, it was about a year that I hadn't been to the Scotland team since the World Cup. So um, things had changed, obviously, during the Six Nations. And then I came back in, I, th- I thought there was ways it could have maybe adapted again. So, yeah, it's, it's not been all as free flowing. You know, I've not played with some of the boys in the Scotland team for, like I say, a year now. So it's kind of getting those connections again, getting those links back together. Um, whereas at Rasen, we've got it here day in, day out, which is good. Sean, from your point of view, like when you get a, a core or a collective group of players, like maybe England have had with Saracens and Ireland have definitely had with Leinster, does it make it easier for you when you're representing your country and you're alongside people that you have played alongside week in, week out? Yeah, it definitely makes a difference. A hundred percent it does. Because you're you you know and you know each other and you know what each other is going to do and what different personalities are bringing to the game, and the other thing is about it probably the style of game. If you have a certain style you want to play, the coach is going to pick, um, you know, pick the players that he thinks is going to represent that best. But that's probably from Leinster's point of view, they've probably been the best over the last while in in Ireland, obviously, um, and Joe obviously coached Leinster and then he came and coached Ireland. And we kept basically the same game plan that we had with Leinster the whole way through Joe's era, which was probably a problem at the end because, um, as Foxy said there earlier in the interview, he knew if he got into our first three phases that they were a, l- a lot more comfortable then in general phase. You know, it, it, it does definitely make a difference knowing that your, your mates that you're playing with each, each week are, um, you know, are there beside you. And it's, it's, it's a lot more comfortable. So, like, I, like for someone coming back, like... Um, if I was asked to go back into the Ireland camp now, for instance, I think it'd be very different for me. It'd be a lot more. It'd be a lot more learning from my end of it, probably, um, to see what they're doing now because you're out of loop when you're out of camp. Familiarity is huge. I think you get once you get those connections, like Finn's talking about. I think 
You know, when I played with uh, Hadley at club level and international level, we had a uh, an understanding that we, you know, we we had a, a we played more rugby together, and you know, it, it definitely helps because you almost you, you your connection is you don't have to talk as much because you you kind of know the traits you get because you've done it so many times. So yeah, no, I think um, having familiarity is a massive positive um when you play in through club into international level and Finn is that something you notice because nobody else is coming over from from racing um into that Scotland camp yeah but I suppose even you know Ali will play differently with with Glasgow than the nines that I'll play with here or Hoggy will play different to, to Zebra Curtly or, or whoever at throwback and everyone just like like you said this plays differently and the connections you have at clubs so much stronger than it international unless you unless you're maybe Ireland and you've got the Leinster boys coming through or, or England with the, the Saracens boys. Like, yeah, I remember when I first joined Scotland there were sixteen guys in the squad that was from Glasgow. So we played week in, week out, trained with each other all the time. So like Johnny said, it's kinda like you don't have to chat as much, you don't have to do as much. You just know what, what you're looking for, what the, the guy outside is gonna look for, what the guy inside you is gonna do, so you can react much better off him. And um, without without having to train it that much during the week. Um, it just flows easier, I think. So and being a ten coming back, it's quite, you know, quite an important position for the attack, especially to try and link with these players quickly. You know, I'm still good mates with them all, but I don't train or play as much as them. So they'll develop and change over the last couple of years. So I've got to kind of adapt to how they've changed and what they do now compared to what they used to do. When you were at Glasgow, I think you shared a flat with Ali Price and you were, um, there was always the talk on your Instagram with the bromance and then it seemed to happen with Zebo. Uh, Sean, you know Zebo pretty well. Um, <laughs> tell us something that we could say on air and Finn can back it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what do I have on Zebo? Nah, he just, he just fancy, he fancies himself as this um, rapper. So he does. He, he definitely thinks he's able to rap properly. He's done it a few times. His um his uh sister is married to one of the guys of Hermitage Green, and um they got him up on stage one year at the festival, and he's done it this bit of a rap. And since then, he's I think he thinks he's a full on rapper, but um he can he can actually pull it off though. Zeebs can pull that stuff off, and his dance moves are are pretty uh, epic as well. In fairness to the man, so he's he's loving life over there, and so is uh. Dunner's Donegal Ryan. So <laughs> it's funny actually seeing it's actually it's funny seeing Donica Ryan in that in that context of people. <laughs> See them go one on one with each other. <laughs> Donica's a big farmer from home, like. Um so he definitely wouldn't be rapping or uh <laughs> dancing. He's the complete opposite of Zeebs. Good good lads, good lads to have, and um, they're being they're being missed um, back home, that's for sure. And good for you to have people like that around you as well, Finn, when you've moved to a different country and it was quite tight in Glasgow and, and it you've got to sort of find your place again, don't you? Yeah, exactly. Um, when I first met Zeebs the first night I moved over. We both stayed in the same hotel um, for about a week or 10 days before we got our houses. Um, so I bumped into him the first night. He was out walking his, like, well, out a walk with his kids. Um, and we just clicked straight away, which is good fun. Um, you know, he's easy to get on with and he's always having a laugh, so it's, it's good. Um and then we moved into the houses, which were like, I don't know, 500 metres, if that, around the corner from each other. So they sort of share lifts in and out of training and we got on, uh, got on really well. But like I say, it kind of helped us both being English speaking and we both kind of had the same sort of jokes or the same the same sort of chat, which was uh, which was good. So I had someone else to kind of do the, the starting off period with, although his French is much better because that's from Martinique. So, you know, he was telling me we'll be in the same French classes and... I thought, right, okay, I've got someone to do French with, but then when we turned up, he understood pretty much everything. So he was uh, slightly further ahead. I, th- I think those 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 groups of those groups of expats people they come. It's become your family. Like when I was in France, like when you move out on your own, those um, Kiwis, Aussies, South Africans, like because you're not away from your families, they become your family. And I remember, you know, you you lean on them for help where being away from family. So it. Like you said, you you create bonds then, and you come pretty tight with them. And like you, you can see that you know, Zebo, you you do a big mate, and I think you know it, it's it's an important thing when you move away from home is is getting a, a friendship and a bond with 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 those ex expat players. What have you uh, made of Scotland over the Autumn Nations Cup, Finn? Um, Defence has been a lot better. Um, we've not let in that many tries. Could obviously get better on attack. Um, so I think I was one of the first two games. Um, so I tried to say a few things that we do here at Rassen that we can maybe bring in with Scotland, but I've not been there obviously the last four weeks. So 
it's been hard to, you know, I suppose, chat to the boys and get a few points across, but also I'm focusing on, on being back here now. Um, but I think, you know, they're doing all right. They're, like, they're, like I said, defence is coming on well. The discipline is good. Um, we just need to work on that attacking side and try and start scoring some more tries, which will then obviously help us win games. But no, it's, it's all right. We've won, won what's that? Four out, no, four out of five games? Three out of four games? I don't know. Three or four games, I think that we've played. So that's been that's been pretty positive for us. Do you know when you said there about um, you've been? Because I know sometimes you're in camp, and even when if you're injured, you're still involved in things. And John, I think you were doing the same when you got injured. Is that what happens? Just to sort of people outside of it, to senior players stay and help out and try and direct the side a little bit. Is that expected of you? Uh, yeah, well, for, for me, they they kept me around because I'm I, I'm fines master in camp, and um, I had to make sure that the boys were running a tight ship. So um, all I was doing was making sure I was getting a bit extra cash off the of boys for for the kitty, you know. So um, yeah, that's that that was pretty much my role the last few weeks, uh, trying to get back fit again. But no, it's it, it's it's something that you know you'd like to be involved, and you'd like to help out. Um, you know, we've got quite a young squad and. Um, just being around the young centres, talking to them, seeing how they're finding it. And, you know, it, it is good to be involved because, um, you know, you, you want to be playing, but if you can help out someone to perform at a level, you know, that's you know, that's a positive. So, you know, it's there is work to be done, even though when you're injured, you can't get on the field. I, I think when you when you sit back as well and when you are injured and, and you kind of sit back and take stock of the way you're trying to do things and you actually pick up some, some stuff that you might necessarily have the exact right thing um, or, or be doing the right thing on the field when you're actually out there. And when you actually sit back and you're actually helping coaches do different bits and pieces, you kind of get it a lot more and understand it a lot more. And you can relate that then to the younger boys, as, as Foxy said, because that's something I found actually actually stepping back away from it and looking at certain areas of the game where we can improve and um, overseeing a little bit of that, especially when you're one of the older lads. And um, getting the younger lads into the video room then, and giving them a bit of um, giving them a bit of knowledge on on what's going on and and why why we're doing what we're doing, you know. Um, and I'm sure it's the same for uh, for Finn. Yeah, I think if I was at Glasgow, I might be in there helping out or trying to look at the attack and side of it, how we can um, how we can get better there. Um, it's different me being being over here in France. I'm kind of excluded from it all now. I still chat with Dunkey a little bit in Ali and. I'll see what I thought of the games, like whenever it is, um, and how they can get better. But it's diff- difficult if you're not in camp and not seeing what's going on in the meetings and during the sessions. So um, I'm trying to kind of watch and, and give a little bit of advice from outside. But it's it's difficult when you're only watching the game at the weekend and not really knowing what messages are getting said through the week. Have you missed being in Scotland, Finn? I know you've just signed for um, Racing for longer, but is there any aspects of um, being at home and, and playing for Glasgow that you've missed? Cash money, cash. <laughs> <laughs> the weather, <Yeah>. the weather. <laughs> no, um, there's not much that, uh, that I've missed, to be honest. Um, it's obviously, it's much easier probably back home, you know, where everything is, it's a smaller city, you can get around easier and and certain things like that. But um, no, there's not much that I've, I've really missed that much. Maybe being able to just speak English with everyone and get my point across much easier would be... It would help a little bit here, but I think I'm getting the hang of that now. <laughs> Let's take a look at the matches that we've got this week because it is the finals weekend of the Autumn Nations Cup and it's England-France in the final. Um, Finn, we know that the situation in France means that they basically cannot pick their strongest side. I think there's 121 caps between the 31-man squad that they have. Um, England-France, who would you fancy in that one then? What is it? Twickenham? Yeah. 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 Nah, France. Look <laughs> at <laughs> <laughs> some folk going to that, but no, I don't know. I think it'll be England are playing well. Um, I don't know. France have got the flair, so I'm, I'm going to back France, you know, all the way for that one. Um, there's a few boys at Racing that got their first cap last week, so <laughs> I'm going to be cheering them on. And yeah, uh, not controversial at all. The Scottish man says France. Uh, Sean, what do you think? Nah, I, I, I just, I don't think they'll have enough experience to beat England. Um, but on the, on the flip side of that, a bunch of young French guys, they'll just go out there and they'll play it, won't they? Um, and that's when the French are most dangerous. So it could be, it could be an exciting game. Hopefully, it's not like that one where we actually um, 
we played Scotland years ago to win the to win the Six Nations, and France and England were playing after us for the, and um, that was that was the craziest day ever. Noah Nakataki was causing carnage out there. I think I remember watching yeah. that as well. Yeah, um, I'm I'm gonna go England. They 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 look extremely strong and organised, uh, and they just are work. They they the work rate at the moment is huge, and I think they're very organised in defence. So. Unfortunately, I don't see the French getting by them. Uh, Foxy, Ireland, Scotland, you can have the first word. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, Scotland, I think, as Finn said, look really organised in defence. I think, um, is it is it Steve Tandy, the defence coach now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, it, is Steve Tandy? Steve, yeah. 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 So, uh, a Welshman organising uh, <laughs> the Scotland team in defence. Uh, you know, I'm... I'm Go Scotland, you know. I'll back the Scotland, the Scottish boys. Oh, yeah. Foxy, Foxy, Foxy. Yeah. <laughs> Relationships <laughs> over, is it, Shorty? <laughs> now I'll, I'll go with um, I'll go with Ireland. Just and I'll go with Ireland. I know they're in a bit of a transition, so I think it's going to be a tight game. Scotland have improved massively in their D, and their scrum has been very good. Um, so they'll be two big areas, but I think Ireland will be pretty annoyed at the way they played the second half the last day. I think um, Robbie and Johnny could be back in for it as well. They were, they were, they were in full train today by, by social media. So if they're back, it'll help a lot. And we might see a little bit more in attack than we did the last day. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Ireland. Finn, I can imagine the answer. Yeah, I know. I, I think, you know, Scott, like we said, their defence is really good. <laughs> I don't know, I think both teams, it depends who they want to play it. Like you say, Ireland are going through a transition kind of year. Um, Scotland might try out a few new guys this weekend. Um, I think it, it could be a game of kind of, of chess, almost waiting to see which team almost cracks first or which team makes a mistake. I don't know if the teams will go out there to win it or if they'll go out there to not lose it. Um, so uh, I, I think for me, the way Ireland play, it could just be kicking the ball up in there and letting the wingers go after it. On the flip side, Scotland might try the same, just to try and wait and see who cracks. So I'm going to go Scotland, but I can't see it being a high-scoring game. All right, um, Finn, you can give us your Wales versus Ireland info. Ireland, <laughs> Italy, uh, Italy. <laughs> sorry, Wales, Italy. <laughs> um, yeah, there's three on the pitch. That one, uh, Wales, Italy. I don't know. Um, I think. Oh, come on. <laughs> I think, I don't know. It's, 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 I think, I Are you really Wales taking probably, your time thinking about this? I, th- I think Wales might win, but Italy will probably play the better rugby, I think. They're, they're playing, now they're changing up quite a lot. Like against Scotland, they played with the uh, 10 and the 12, the can at 12 and the, the young guy at 10. And they actually played some open rugby with good kicks. So they're playing pretty good rugby, but they die out in the last 20 minutes. So I think it'll be quite a good game to watch and for for Italian tacking like they were for me the better team in the Scotland game in the first half and then died out the last twenty. So I think I think Wales will win, but I think Italy will be will be right in there until the last you know, twenty, twenty five minutes, I think. Do you agree guys? Yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Wales Wales won't be they'll 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 stick with them for a period of time, the Italians, but uh Wales will come good in the end. That'll be their second, hopefully their, their first, is it their first win? Second win, second win. <laughs> second win, second win. Yeah, yeah no, I think, uh, as as the boys said, yeah, I'll agree with them. <laughs> just to finish off, how good will it be if we actually just see Fiji get in a match? I mean, I think we all really went into this competition hoping that we'd see what they could do. And Foxy, it's just not worked out well. No, I, you know, it's, you know, hugely unfortunate. Well, as a player, you're probably quite glad you don't have to play Fiji because, you know, on their day, they're <laughs> as dangerous as, um, you know, any team in the world. Um, but, yeah, you know, hopefully they can get a game and just showcase what they what they can do. Um, obviously, you'd be up against them not being able to train fully. But, um, you know, if, if we can see that against Georgia, because, you know, Georgia deserve another game as well to show, what you know, how they've improved as well. So that would be um, a competitive game, I'm sure. And I think... Um, Fiji be after some, um, you know, after the loss they had in the World Cup last year. So, um, you know, that could be a tasty affair. Baron Cotter's Fiji fin. Yes, I was like, I was looking forward to <clears throat> seeing them play as well. I think Vern will be good for them, and 
I know, I know Ben Fuller, Fuller from here, obviously. So I think uh, Vernon put some simple but effective structure in the Fiji, and, um, but I still allow them to play with their um, expansive offloading game. So uh, I was actually really excited to see how they how they played under Vern. Um, so I, th- I think they'll be, they'll be good and it'll be a really good game to watch this weekend. And Sean, in terms of Fiji and uh, Georgia, you know, it's not one that you would head into at the start of this competition thinking we'd like to watch this one necessarily. But actually, because the way that we've seen Georgia progress, like you were talking about at the start of this programme, because we haven't seen Fiji at all, you know, it's an interesting matchup. It's probably going to be the most interesting game of the whole uh, autumn <laughs> series, to be fair, because Fiji, will, you know what you're going to get with Fiji. So they're going to throw the ball around. And they're going to throw outrageous offloads and they're going to take risks. But on the back, on the other side of that, as Finn said, I'm looking forward to seeing the bit of structure that Vern has brought to their play that will actually bring it, bring their game to a different level. Um, but it's, it'll, it'll be an entertaining game, no doubt about it. Uh, we have a, we, one of our number eights, Albert, is, is uh, playing for Fiji. So it be interesting to see big bad Albert out there as well. He's a, he's a, he's a bit of a unit. So he has his hands the size of, I don't know, they're like shovels. Like he goes around with the ball in one hand. And you'd be just, you'd be hoping that he doesn't throw this outrageous offload at times. But he's, um, it'd be interesting to see him playing now. And I'm looking forward to, to that game actually at the weekend. Yeah, it would be good to wrap this competition up and then head into Champions Cup. We'll talk about that next week. Um, but Finn, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Foxy, Sean, good luck with your recoveries as well. We'll see you on the pitch soon and we'll see you back here very shortly. Uh, thanks very much to you at home as well for choosing House of Rugby. Bye-bye. You've been watching the House of Rugby Season 3 on Joe.